praise God and welcome to Bible class. Again, call somebody. Let them know that the Bible class is on the air. I greet you in the love of Jesus, knowing that he will make up the difference. It is a wonderful thing to have a God that was first made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So call someone, tell them, get your iPad, your iPhones, your ideas, and just bring them, and we're going to talk to you today about God's Word. We are studying the book of Colossians, so we're going to pick up where we left off. Let's pray. Father, it is the entrance of thy Word that bringeth light and life, and we pray that the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ would shine bright as always. May the people be blessed by thee and never impressed by me. Call through the revelation of thy word, these thy people to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, and to follow you more nearly. Now, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And every glad heart said, Amen. Well, praise God. We praise God for his way, for his word. We praise God for his anointing. And we thank God for all that he is doing. Let's go to Colossians, the first book of Colossians. Hallelujah. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I would fall. And when I am sad, to Him I go. No other one can cheer me. So when I'm sad, he makes me glad. He is my. to the Lord in prayer. As we discussed last week, the book of Colossians is part of the trilogy. For Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians were written about the same time in A.D. 62 from Rome, where the Apostle Paul was a prisoner. This epistle was written to a church that Paul did not preach out, neither had he ever physically attended. This was a church plant by Epaphras or Epaphroditus. He was an evangelist whom we will discuss in more detail a little later on in the lesson. We also taught that Paul was made an apostle after the will of God. Finally, we ended on the Godhead, as Paul tells us in the second and third verse, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. 
We want to pick up this week and talk about prayer, as prayer must be maintained if you are going to have consistency in your walk. Hope, that hope which is laid up for the saint. And fruit, that fruit one should bear as a believer. So let's go to Colossians 3, and we will commence reading at the third verse. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you. Not just a simple prayer. Not just when it's convenient or not just when you're in trouble. But it says, we give thanks to God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. I, I, I know that during this time of pandemic, we have stepped up our prayer game. I'm not that cool. I heard somebody else say that. But we have stepped up uh, how we pray or how often we pray. Um, and that's good. And we're not praying to things get better and then we lax our position or our fervor in prayer. But we have to learn how to regularly, consistently pray. Praying always for you. I know uh, we have uh, a pastor, uh, Pastor George Blanks, and before he was pastor, he was a member here, and he was very faithful in 6 a.m. prayer, and he, he still is faithful as he pastors in Bessemer, Alabama. But I would be in prayer, and he would be not too far from me. And when Blanks would pray, you knew who he was going to pray for. He prayed for everybody in his family. I mean, he named them. And Father, help Ray Ray. And he, he called him out by name. And it, it, he was faithful and consistent. And that's what you have to be. I know his kids are laughing. But my, that's what you have to do. You have to be consistent in prayer. You have to always pray. It doesn't make a difference if you, if you write out a list and say their, say their names. You know, as folk are marching in the streets for uh, Equality as it relates to justice and the folk that have been uh, killed without due process and those that have died in the streets, they're marching and they have ones that say their names, Breonna Taylor, say their names, George Floyd, say, say and, and they, 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 and I understand it. They want you to say it because we don't want it just to become uh, obscure. We, doesn't, we don't want their lives to mean nothing. I got it. And, and it's the same way we should approach God. If we're praying for our children, if we're praying for our daughters, if we're praying for our sons, if we're praying for our parents, if we're praying for our job, if we're praying for our education, don't be afraid to just say it. Speak it. Lord, heal my grandmother. Lord, heal Whatever their name is, call that name out. Hallelujah. And you don't have to worry about it falling on deaf ears. God is going to hear it. But what I want to establish here is that there has to be the continuum. There has to be the consistent prayer life. And if you're praying about the same thing, do it. I've heard preachers say in their uh, haste, or maybe in their ignorance, you don't have to keep telling God the same time thing he heard you the first time. You don't have to keep it, oh, no, 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 no. This is a principle. As you will find out when you read all of the epistles of Paul, 
he talks about always praying and always praying for them in specificity. I'm praying for you, not in the past tense, I prayed for you, but I am praying. Your prayer has to be constant. Give us this day, Jesus told the disciples. So there has to be a constant daily prayer. Oh, I'm trying to move on, but it seems that the Holy Spirit has me in neutral here. So often, we get up off of our knees, we end our prayer, and we say, God heard us, and I don't have to revisit that. Oh, you should continue to revisit it. And one of the reasons you need to revisit it is because things change. Even in the lives of the persons that you're praying for, situations may have changed. They may have gotten past what you prayed for. Oh, we have that victory. But something else is coming. Something else is coming that is going to require me to continue to be in communication with God on your behalf. So I really want to establish how we must be consistent in prayer. Glory to God. Let's go to, I believe it's, uh, let me see, let's go to Mark. I think it's Mark. Just this, this was not on my notes, just something that just was quickened in my spirit here. Let me see if I can get it real quick. Glory to God. Yes, Mark the first chapter. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mark 1, and uh, this is after Jesus had healed Simon Peter's uh, wife's mother of a fever. Uh, when he lifted her up and they ministered at the 32nd verse, it says, and at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. 35th verse. Now, Jesus has just healed Simon Peter's mother, and because of that miracle, folk went home and got sick folk, and when he, you know, got up, he said, whoa, they were all at the door, and he healed them, right? The next morning, 35th verse, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Did you get that? Here is the Son of God. Here is Emmanuel. Here is with us God. The Bible says in John that he, he had the Spirit without measure. So there was no depletion of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They're bringing him the sick, many disease, diverse maladies. Demons were being cast out. Devils were trying to speak, and Jesus would quiet them. And he prayed and healed them. But early in the morning, as grandmama used to say, four day in the morning, Jesus would get up and go to a solitary place and pray. If he needed to pray, I think I need to pray. I mean, after a miracle has been performed, he went out to pray. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to spend too much time on this. What was he praying for? He wasn't praying for the Holy Ghost. He had that. The relationship that Jesus had with the Father 
needed to be maintained. And if he just did it as an example to us, because you'll see in the next verse that Simon and them followed him. They found out where he was, and they went to that place. We have to be consistent in our prayer life. We have, no matter how God has used us, no matter how he's anointed us, we have to find that place of solace. We have to make ourselves get up, as it were, and go have conversation with Jesus. Amen? So as we look at Colossians, he says, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. I said this a couple of weeks ago in, in uh, one of our Sunday services that the proof that you have the love of God is how you treat your brother. I cannot stand and in uh, clear conscience say that I love God and I don't love my brother. Hallelujah. We're praying. And after we pray, there has to be the demonstration of the faith that we have in God. And the only way we can really show God that we love him is how we treat our brothers and our sisters, how we treat those that are in our community, how, those, how we treat those that are in our workplace. It is all about showing the love of God through your sensitivity to others through your caring of others when people see you and they say oh that's such a nice person what they really should be saying is oh that person is really showing the love of God you know you have to know I'm not that nice I have some people that will say we know pastor I'm a nice guy but my point is, the goodness that you see exemplified is not me. It has to be the love of God. Hallelujah. And, and we as believers must show the love of God to the saints. We have to show the saints that we care. We have to show the saints that we are concerned. Buying some groceries, buy an extra bag. Bring it to somebody that you know is in trouble. Help somebody. Nobody, nobody, every, we have a habit now that if ever someone needs them, call the church. That, that's fine. We're going to do, do our due diligence. But could God have placed that person in your path for you to do something? And that's what we have to consider. We have to consider that God has placed people in our path that we might convey and display the love of God. Hallelujah. He says, since the day that we heard of your faith in Christ and the love to all the saints, we have to love the saints. Now, I, I was listening uh, to this particular denomination. They were talking about this lady that had uh, been canonized by this particular church. It wasn't the Catholic church, but it was, I believe, an Episcopal church. And they were talking about 
this lady that was canonized. I think she was the first black uh, woman canonized by the Episcopal Church. Her name escapes me. But I thought about it and I said, wow. Based on the word of God, every believer is a saint. Every kingdom citizen is a saint. I don't have to wait to die to be a saint. I grew up in the church. Well, that's what we called the members, brothers and sisters, saints. When they stood to testify, giving honor to God, the pastor, to the members, saints, and friends. It, it was an honor to be a saint. And then growing up in the church, we were, we were known as children of the saint. Uh, and that is a colloquialism that has somehow lost its way in, in church vernacular. Instead of claiming it, we say things like, I ain't no saint. Well, you should be. Ooh. Y'all just keep coming to the Bible class. Keep coming. I want to turn your attention to Romans, the first, first chapter. And I'll begin reading at the sixth verse. I want to look at the seventh verse. This is what it says. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So sainthood is part of my calling. It's not something I'm waiting for to die and someone canonize me and I have to have three miracles and four witnesses and seven shoes and all. I ain't waiting for all that stuff, whatever they do to canonize, canonize people. I'm called to be saints. Hallelujah. And you are called to be a saint of God. When these uh, salutations are going out, he specifically says to the saints. He's not talking about a bunch of dead people. He's talking about the people in the church. Glory to God. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which ye have to all the saints. When you go around, when you travel, or if you're in the, school, in, in, in the store and you run into somebody, used to be a time where you could see that they were saved or not because the saints used to be dressed different. I'm just going to sit right here and smile at that. Now it's a little bit more difficult. But I remember growing up, you could see a certain hairstyle and say, oh, they saved. Uh, <laughs> you could tell. You saw the length of their dress. You saw uh, how they were, were absent of a whole lot of makeup. And you knew they were saints. And so you walk in, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And then, you know, the way you talk. You say, hey, baby, what's up? That, that's not, that, wasn't, that wasn't the salutation of the saints. I'm not asking you to go back. I'm, I'm just trying to tell you how we grew up. We, 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 we didn't say that. What's happening? No, the saints didn't greet like that. The saints said, grace and peace. And somebody would holler, grace and peace be multiplied. Th those were the salutations of the saints. A little bit more different now. And I know some folk are laughing at me. It's all right. I'm just trying to tell you. To love the saints, to love to be in the company of the saints, to understand the depth 
of the fellowship of the saints. Ooh, can I, can I, can I read something to you? I was wondering when I was going to get to it, and today is the day. So if you travel with me to uh, Corinth, and let's go to the first uh, book of, um, I'm sorry, uh, 2 Corinthians. I believe that's where I want to be. 2 Corinthians, the, uh, no, 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. That's where I want to go. 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Glory to God. And I want to read this to you. I'll start at the first verse, and then I'll skip, because the first verse will give us uh, the context of our lesson here. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, this is pretty bad, that there was this type of incestual relationship it wasn't his mother, it was his father's wife, okay? So uh, it was a stepmom, but that, that kind of nonsense shouldn't happen, period, and it certainly shouldn't happen in the church. And watch the church's response in the second verse. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. In other words, there are certain behaviors that as saints we should not participate in. Can you, can you hold it right there? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Go to, stay right there. I'm coming back. I haven't forgotten my spot. This is what would happen if we were in Bible class live. But... Uh, uh, you know, someone would be reading for me. Let's go to Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Hallelujah. Yeah, Ephesians, the fifth chapter and the third verse. This is what it says. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, watch it, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. Not Christians, but saints. The behavior of the saint should be differentiated than that of a sinner. The saints. Let's go back to Corinthians. I'm becoming, tell somebody, I'm becoming a saint. I'm becoming a saint. I'm not just becoming a church member. I'm becoming a saint. I'm not just becoming a, a part of this denomination. I am becoming a saint. And if I'm going to become a saint, then I have to quell ungodly behavior. Or say it as he's going to say in, in Colossians, the third chapter, I have to mortify. I have to kill. I have to deaden the deeds of my flesh. All right, let's get back to this fellow that was so bold as to uh, go with his father's wife and, um, and not be sorry, okay? I, wanna, I want you to go all the way down to the ninth verse. It says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. He said, if you're not going to talk to somebody that's a fornicator, you might have to leave earth because a whole lot of that is going on. But he, he really uh, establishes who he's talking to in this uh, 11th verse. But now have I written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such in one not to eat. He says, if you know a brother that is in an ungodly relationship, or he just bed hopping, then you're not to even have company with them. If he calls himself a brother, if he says, I am saved, 
and you know he getting to walk, getting ready to walk into the house. All right, brother, see you next time at church. And he getting ready to walk in the house with a woman that's not his wife. You need to have conversation. Hey, 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 hey. sir, this is going to be our last dinner together. Oh, you think you're better than me? No, I have a mandate of scripture that if you're going to be a fornicator, I can't keep company with you. Ooh, I know some of y'all think, is, is that in the Bible? I just read it to you. Go back and read it again. I know we're living in a day where these types of teachings are no longer the norm, where we're just grabbing everybody and saying, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm a different kind of Christian. No, it, it, are you a saint? And if you are a saint, there are behaviors that have to be adhered to. And the Apostle Paul clearly writes that if you say that you are a brother and you are an extortioner, a fornicator, a covetous person, if you are an idolater, if you say I'm a Christian and you got beads on to various gods, or you're somewhere in yogurt and, and namaste and all that kind of nonsense. Oh, I'm walking down this line here today. If you are an idolater or a drunkard, then this word says, I'm not to eat with you. No, we can't go shopping. No, we can't do this until there is some corrective behavior. Watch, watch this, watch this. Twelfth verse. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do you not judge them that are within? Now, what is the purpose of this letter? I'm glad you asked. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians, the... Uh, Seventh chapter. Mm, mm, mm. Glory to God. Let's go to the uh, eighth verse as the Apostle Paul talks about this letter. For though I made you sorrow, uh, the second Corinthians seven and eight, for though I made you sorry with a letter, that first epistle, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. What was the purpose of not having fellowship? It was so that the person that was in that bad behavior would miss the fellowship of the saints to the point that he said, I got to change this. That going in that house, he says, honey, I'm not coming back anymore uh, unless we get married. Why? Because I miss the fellowship of the saints. I want to be, hallelujah, I want to be in the fellowship of the saints. I want to be in the fellowship of people that know how to get in touch with the master. I want to be in the fellowship of folk that learn how to overcome the will of the flesh. I want to have connectivity to those that are connected to Christ. It's not just about, well, let me go to church, let the preacher say a few words, and then let me sneak out to the car. No, it is the whole fellowship of the saints. Glory to God. We need one another. I'll read that 10th verse. Well, the ninth verse. Now I rejoice that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrow to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So the fellowship of the saints was so important that you did not want to lose that. Hallelujah. Let's go to, to uh, 
uh, Acts, the second chapter, and the 42nd verse, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. You see, when Peter preached that message, and about 3,000 souls were saved, hallelujah, they recognize that I am in a minority, that most folk around me don't know Jesus. I'm in a minority. And so if I'm going to keep my faith up, I need to stay with the saints. Hallelujah. I need, be, I need to be surrounded by the saints because it is a different community. It is a different kingdom. And today we have a church that is so worldly that wants to get right next to the world and say, you can't tell the difference. That is not what holiness is about. That is not what salvation is about. He told him in Leviticus, put a difference between clean and unclean. Put a difference between holy and unholy. Glory to God. And we want to maintain the fellowship of the saints. That's one of the reasons David said, I was glad when they said unto me, come let us go into the house of the Lord. To go into the house of God means I'm going to be in the company of those that believe like I believe. So the fellowship of the saints is important. Boy, have I spent too much time on this? I don't think so. I think that you need to understand to be surrounded by people that love God, that are of the same ilk as you, that believe like you, that trust and hope like you is vitally important to your aspiration as a believer. So the Apostle Paul says, I'm going to continue to pray for you. I'm continuing to pray for you from the day that I heard of your faith because you love the saints. Hallelujah. Now this fifth verse. Oh, my, 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 my. Fifth verse of the first book of Colossians. For the hope which is laid up for you in Heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Mm, mm, mm. If the believer is robbed of his or hers hope, then half of the battle is won. And we as preachers, we as believers, must defend the faith of the hope. We as the defenders of the faith must not allow others to make us feel as if our hope is for naught. I'm not going to be able to go much further. The devil has deceived a lot of us because he has robbed us of our hope. We say things like, well, I know they're going to a better place. That may sound okay, but we are not ignorant concerning where the believer is going. I get happy thinking about this. I guess you can tell. I am fully persuaded that this life is not the end. That when I die, it's not over. Glory to God. There is a hope. And pardon me for hollering now because I moved out of the teaching into the preaching thing. There is a hope for the believer that is laid up. 
This is not wishful thinking. He tells us that it is the truth of the gospel. If I take away the hope that is laid up, then my gospel is non-productive. Why have it? Some folk in Paul's day, and I won't go to it now because my time is out, 1 Corinthians, the uh, 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 15th chapter. I ain't going to go to it. I'm just going to look, look over at it. I ain't going to make you go to it. I just, I just want to, you know, just be correct in what I'm saying here because this thing is real here. Yes, sir. 15th chapter, they had doubts as to whether or not so many of the saints were dying and they really believed that Jesus would come back during their time and many of the old timers were dying and folk were dying and some people thought they needed to help the church out, so they put out an erroneous thought that the resurrection had happened already. And Paul said, hold up a minute. If the resurrection had happened, or if there don't be a resurrection, then we're still in our sins. See, your hope, hallelujah, your hope of the gospel is inextricably tied to your hope that is laid up I'm not just being saved so I could be known as a nice guy. And I understand, folk, yeah, you know, there's an African proverb that if, if someone calls your name, you'll live forever. That's, I ain't living saved so somebody can call my name. I have a hope that when it is over, hallelujah, that God is going to come get me out of the grave. That's my hope. <laughs> I got to stop. Go to, go to uh, uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy 4 and 7. We'll pick up here next week. 2 Timothy 4 and 7. It, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, that means from now on, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And here's the hope. And not me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. So the hope is, hallelujah, that when this life is over, I got something laid up for me. The saints have to die in that hope. And we know it to be true. I'll read that again, Colossians 5. I mean, Colossians 1 and 5. For the hope which is laid up for you where in heaven. So we have people say, yeah, your heaven is down here on earth. No, it ain't. No, 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 no. My heaven ain't down here on earth. I don't care how much money I get. I don't care what zip code I live in. I don't care how much uh, health insurance I have. My heaven! is not here on earth. I don't care how nice the neighborhood is, how well the school district is. My heaven is not here on earth. I don't care if they haven't had a homicide since 1973. I don't care if they don't have folk breaking in their house. My heaven is not here on You can't make my heaven here on earth. I got a hope that's laid up in heaven. It's not a pie in the sky, it's a hope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to talk more about this hope next week. As you can see, I got a little excited. Uh, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The hope that the saints have is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the Lord, if you don't know him, then you don't have a hope laid up. 
But you can get your business fixed. You can make it right. Hallelujah. My record will be there. Glory to God. And I want your record to be clear. The saints use a song, used to sing a song, says, and my record states today how he washed my sins away. And the old account was settled long ago. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can get that account settled today. Repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Hallelujah. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the hope of your salvation. Let me know that I have something laid up for me when this life is over. Glory to God. Father, I thank you for each prayer prayed. I thank you for what you're doing, that you are just inciting your people to study your word, to know for themselves that they have a hope laid up in heaven. We're not guessing about it. We know it. It is the truth of the gospel. Thank you for saving. In Jesus' name, amen. Perfecting is concerned about your spiritual growth and development. If you receive Christ today, then please, please, some of you have done it. I want everyone to do it. Please give us your contact information by emailing it to salvation at perfectingchurch.org. That's salvation at perfectingchurch.org. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Perfecting, it's time to sow. Family and friends of perfecting, remember, we have a new way to give. For those who used to use push pay, now use PC text to, to give. I want you to sow your seed, $20, $25, $50, whatever the Lord has laid on your heart, $100, $1,000, whatever. I want you to get that seed and I want you to sow it in faith, knowing that God will be no man's debtor. But so in expectation. Oh, go rande, mandaba. I feel the presence of the Lord. Father, we thank you for those that are sowing today. Do it for them. Make it happen in their lives. Give them a harvest. And we'll give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We praise God. Please pay attention to the giving instructions and stay in the cyber sanctuary even after your giving. Perfecting Church has four ways to give. Text to give is quick, simple, and very secure. Text perfecting to 73256. You may also give by cash app at dollar sign PC Detroit. Please remember to add your name, address, and contribution designation to the notes. Online giving is available at www.perfectingchurch.org or you may mail your contribution to Perfecting Church, 7616 East Nevada Street, Detroit, Michigan, 48234. We pray God's blessing upon you and your seed sown. Thank you for your support to Perfecting Church. Good evening. It is time for the PC News. What a powerful lesson tonight. We encourage you to allow this word to minister to you all week long. Visit the Perfecting Church e-store and download it and other anointed messages preached by Pastor Winans. You will be blessed. Join the mighty men of Issachar this Saturday, October 3rd at 10 a.m. in a live virtual panel discussion. Let us reason. We will see you on Facebook or YouTube for a powerful sharing. Don't miss this wonderful event. Perfecting is a wonderful church filled with God's presence and loving people. If you're looking for a church home, look no further. Send an email to membership at perfectingchurch.org and we will welcome you to our family. It's prayer time. We encourage everyone to join Perfecting this Saturday at 5.10 p.m. for prayer. Call 351-888-7481. Yes, it's time to pray. Back by popular demand, Ladies' Day. Save the date for Saturday, October 10th for a spiritually uplifting, interactive, and definitely unforgettable experience. Ladies, 
planned for another Riverwalk takeover as well. Ladies' Day at 10 a.m., followed by a Riverwalk takeover at 2 p.m. What a day! Feel free to contact our offices at 313-365-3787 for any additional information. Thank you for your attention to The News. Thank you for your support today. I praise God for all of you that have been so faithful in supporting, perfecting. Join us this Saturday at 10 a.m. on Facebook or your YouTube in our virtual panel discussion hosted by the mighty men of Issachar. I also personally invite you to join us uh, perfecting this Saturday for prayer at 10, 5, 10 p.m. Again, our men's department is putting a wonderful virtual uh, panel discussion together about what's going on in, in the lives of black men in America. And I want you to be a part of it. And then join us at 510 for prayer. Father, I thank you for this time around your word. Let them be not only hearers, but doers. In Jesus' name, amen.